The cross is the embodiment of love. This makes us boast in the cross. Why should one boast in the cross? I'll give you a simple explanation, one I think you all have felt. A person's net worth is the love one receives from people. Being rich does not heal you. Having status also does not heal you. If you want to boast, boast that you have many beloved people in your life and that you are beloved by many. The appropriate pride of mankind is the magnitude of the relationships filled with love in your life. Because of this, St. Paul said, I'm not talking about just a human who loves. I do not boast in the love of people because I boast in God's love and there is no love that I will choose, that I will boast in like the love on the cross. Galatians 6.14 God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I am very proud that people love me, this is nothing compared to God's opinion, who himself loves me. But the greatest, most beautiful, most revealing love exists in the cross. Therefore, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because people's love is nothing next to God's love. God's love ex is extremely plentiful and beautiful, yet there's nothing more beautiful than his love on the cross. Therefore, God forbid that I should boast except in his love on the cross. That's what made St. Paul so connected to the cross. It made him say, I know nothing except the cross. It kept his mind busy day and night because he loved God and was fully satisfied with the love of the cross. Our teacher, St. Paul the Apostle, speaks about the cross in Ephesus chapter 3 while he was in prison. Of course, when one imprisoned for, God's, for Christ's sake, he is living the meaning of what he said in Philippians 3.10, fellowship of Christ's sufferings, meaning St. Paul has now achieved the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Christ was imprisoned. I'm in prison, like him. Christ was beaten. I've been beaten, like him. So St. Paul feels that he has come very close to Christ, the crucified, because he is sharing Christ's pain. So while St. Paul was in prison, he said something in the book of Ephesians so very deep that they consider it to be a mystery. This is Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. For this reason, I bow my knees. What is St. Paul doing? He's prostrating. He's old and imprisoned, but he still prostrates himself. To the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He, he, he falls to his knees before the possessor of heaven and earth. Why? That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. St. Paul wants God to give you according to the riches of his glory. To the extent of God's wealth and greatness, he wants God to deliver you something. I'm in prison, says St. Paul. I can't deliver it to you. I'm imprisoned and I prostrate before God and say to him, Lord, please, for the sake of the riches of your glory, deliver to them what I'm going to tell you. To be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. St. Paul wants the Holy Spirit to give you lots of power inside you. While you, were, while you are where you are. That Christ might dwell, might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, we all love Jesus, but we're not rooted in love. We all love Jesus, but we're not grounded in love. We all know that God loves us, but we are not rooted and grounded in it. The cross, or love, is not heavy. So St. Paul says, I pray intensely and prostrate before God so he'll give you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, but why? Let's find out. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. What's the target? What is, what is it that St. Paul wants to deliver? He says, I want you to taste what I've tasted and what all the saints have tasted. What have you and all the saints tasted then? 
And what is the, the hard to understand concept you want to deliver to us that you intensely prostrate yourself to God so he'll give it to us to taste? Lord, let them be rooted, let them be grounded, that they may be able to comprehend with all the saints. So this is something that all the saints taste. What's the meaning of what is the width and length and depth and height? When drawn, these four dimensions make the sign of the cross. These four dimensions let you know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. When it says, which passes knowledge, this means it's impossible for anyone to know it. It's impossible for anyone to reach the completion point of he loved them to the end. It's impossible no matter how deep we go. But at the very least, let's try to go deeper to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. What is hidden within these words? The cross wants to tell you a lot of stuff. What have you comprehended from it? Come, let's comprehend with all the saints. That which took St. Anthony to the desert is what made St. Anthony. He, comprehend, he comprehended the width and length and depth and height. That which took Emba Paul to become the first hermit and not see the face of a man for 70 years, let him know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That which let St. Athanasius get exiled five times and defy the entire world, the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So he loved them to the end. He knows that his hour had come. Everything is under his control. Judas is betraying him. And all of that is the preference of the cross because there are many dimensions and many mysteries that are summarized by the words, the Lord loves you so much. But to comprehend these words, the Lord loves you so much, is the whole matter of life. It's the affair of all the saints. It's the concern of life itself and requires prayers and contemplation and prison and to be strengthened with might through his spirit to get to that place. And take note, that place has no end. What does this mean? It means the closer you get to the cross of our Lord, the more you feel his love. As you approach the length of the cross, you'll know what it means for God to love all of mankind. Its length is extremely long. To know its width, no matter what man has done, no matter how much he slandered, to know its depth, even if man was buried in Hades and deserves to perish. He went down to Hades through the cross to save them. To know the height of the cross, it opens up for you the gates of paradise and heaven and glories with no end. These are the dimensions. Love without limits in every direction. That's the matter of the cross, which we should be occupied with. Every time you stand under the cross, it tells you, our Lord loves you so much. And he loves you to the degree that no man can understand. This means that to the extent that a person comprehends these dimensions, he becomes saintly. Pay attention to the end of the passage. To comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Meaning, Reap from God as much as you want. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians 1.12 Hurry and take from his fullness as much as you want. And of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace. John 1.16 So take from God. Stand in front of the cross and fill yourself up with love without limits. We all suffer from deprivation of love. Old parents have children who have forgotten them. The little child feels his parents are not filling him up with love. The husband feels his wife doesn't feel his pain. The wife feels her husband doesn't love her as he ought to. The friend doesn't feel that his confidant is faithful. Nobody is full. But St. Paul, who suffered the loss of all things and was thrown into prison, awaiting his execution, says, I'm not praying for myself. I bow my knees to the ground that God will grant them to comprehend with all the saints a little width, a little length, a little depth, a little height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Meaning, they will grow in the Lord without limits. 
When you enter inside God, it's as if you jumped in an unlimited sea. And that's what St. Gregory wrote in the Divine Liturgy when it says, no, no manner of speech is able to define the deep expanse of your love for mankind. There is no expression that adequately expresses all this, the foundation of which is the cross and its dimensions. Because of this, many of the saints have called this the Shabka, or the bride's engagement gift. As, for, as far as the church is concerned, the cross is the Shabka. Any wife walks around proud of her Shabka, and she boasts that this is her Shabka. And its value is as great as her husband is rich. And the more her husband loves her, the more, her, the more expensive the shepka will be. The bride's shepka is now the cross. The cross in our hands is like any shepka in the hands of any woman. It's our pride. It's our boasting. That's why we wear crosses and make crosses in everything and draw crosses on everything. That's our pride. That's the sign of love that the bridegroom has for us and the covenant between him and us. That's why those who deny the cross don't appreciate it. If the bride hides her shepka, the meaning of this act is really difficult from the perspective of the bridegroom. She doesn't deserve the shepka. She doesn't appreciate all he did to get her this expensive shepka. And that's why St. Peter said, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 He paid a great price for you. Take note that all the churches and all the prayers and the very foundation of our relationship with God is the cross. The cross represents a number of things. We carry the cross, we wear the cross, we draw the cross, and we say, in the name of the cross. As much as we can, and at all times, we bring about the mentioning of the cross. The word cross itself has power. Just the word itself. Drawing the cross also has power. Hanging the cross up has power. The people love the cross, because the cross unites us to God, and he loves to the degree of the cross, which became a sign of love. Everyone who comes to the cross, his heart pounds because this word cross is sweeter than any words from the lips of someone saying, I love you. The same concept can be seen in the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. How much did Abraham love Isaac? Imagine someone who had been waiting for his son for 40 years. Abraham was about 100 years old when Isaac was born, and it's well known that as a person gets older, his emotions overflow. So he's old and received the child, the child he'd been waiting for, the child of promise, who will inherit everything, who came about by a great miracle. Sarah was barren, and her body was considered dead. This child Isaac was Abraham's joy. From the time he received Isaac, he could laugh. His life had flavor. Abraham was the richest man in the world, but all the world and its money brought nothing next to Isaac. Then God told Abraham, Give me Isaac. Offer him as a burnt sacrifice. God put Abraham through the hardest trial that ever came upon mankind. It was the hardest test, and that's the secret to Abraham's greatness. God told him, Give me your only son, whom you love. With these words, God's God's pressing on the wound. Offer him as a burnt sacrifice. Then Abraham says, Okay. But let's feel together the emotions that Abraham was feeling. For 40 years, his father was waiting for his son, who is his joy and laughter, who is his life, who is the true heir. And Abraham can't tell his wife, of course. He takes Isaac, and he knows he's not going to return home with Isaac. Abraham raises the knife up with full intention of doing the deed because God said so. His heart is breaking and tearing with the huge love inside Abraham. God tells him, Stop your hand. It pleased me to reveal to you the meaning of the cross. Due to the magnitude of the love in your heart that you would give me your only son, I love you and Isaac. More than that, 
Therefore, this knife is not going to strike Isaac. It's going to strike me. I will take Isaac's place. I will sacrifice myself. So God brought Abraham a lamb. I can only imagine that Abraham ran to the lamb, kissing and hugging it, because that lamb gave him his life and spirit back and continued to do so throughout the generations, all the way up until John the Baptist, who came pointing to Jesus, saying, This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the lamb who was tied to the tree and saved Isaac. This is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Ask Abraham, will you die for Isaac's sake? He'd say, of course, ask any father. Would you prefer to be sacrificed instead of Isaac? Of course. I wish my life were requested of me. Well, how about this, God says. Not you and not Isaac. I'll take his place. After this, what is the value of the cross to Abraham? What's the value of carrying the cross in his eyes? The answer, precious. Therefore, this love is what made St. Paul say, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8.32 When a person who came close to the cross and understands the meaning of he loved them to the end, makes a request from God, he gets embarrassed. What will he say when making a request? What could he possibly ask for after the cross? If he requested the entire world, frankly, he didn't understand the meaning of the cross. The world? Ask Abraham. The world or Isaac? He'll tell you, the world? The world has no value. So when we approach the cross, the world shrinks and becomes very small with all of its ambitions and its lusts and its demands. Thus, the person who loves God doesn't want anything at all. He says, Lord, after you've given me the cross, I can't ask for anything else. After the cross, there are no requests. Because of this, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8.32 Eternity is cheap compared to the cross. The entire kingdom of heaven, which you cannot imagine in all its glory and greatness, is very little compared to the cross, compared to the sacrifice on the cross. Consequently, for the one who closely approaches the cross, the world shrinks and all requests disappear. Therefore, the cross transforms a person into a power of flaming love, making him thank God continuously and love people without limits. The people trip you, they interrupt you, they steal your rights, they step on your dignity. All of that becomes very small, and it has no value if we busy ourselves with the cross, if we see the cross. Because of this, our church loves the cross. Some churches like chanting, and that's beautiful. But I love our Coptic church because it has more depth than that. It doesn't just compose lyrics of love about the cross. It makes the cross something binding to a person. Every time we say, Lord, have mercy, we make the sign of the cross. Every time we say, Holy, we make the sign of the cross. Every time we enter somewhere, we make the sign of the cross. Every time we eat something, we make the sign of the cross. Every time we get scared, we say, in the name of the cross. And so the remembrance of the cross is busying us, not once a day, but rather tens of times a day. And as soon as the, the clock strikes 12, our hearts hurt. Why? This is the hour of the cross, when Jesus was crucified. And we drop everything in our hands and say to him, Lord, because of me and for me you were crucified. You are my Lord and I am a person that has no importance. And we begin to talk with him about the cross. Through every moment when we remember the cross, we are pressed and compelled. For this reason the Bible says, the love of Christ compels us. 2 Corinthians 5.14 the love of the cross transforms a person to love people. The person who loves Christ loves the cross, which is the sign of, of God's great love for me and the key to one's relationship between him and God. Therefore, I cling to the cross because it's what will bring me into heaven. 
if I feel full and satisfied with God's love and I understand how God gave me dignity and love through the cross, I will be ready to love any person. I imagine the commandment to love your enemies never could have come without the cross. Love your enemies has no logic, and the power of a man could never suffice to let him love his enemy. But after knowing the cross, coming close to the cross, and receiving power from the cross, suddenly loving one's enemies is not difficult. You will discover that you are given power that St. Paul had and energy to love your enemies. It's not from you. The one who is crucified is able to say, Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Luke 23, 34. One would ask, they do not know what they do. One of us would say, they're heartless, they're, they're conspirators, they're liars. No, they do not know what they do. Jesus doesn't just request their forgiveness. He offers up an excuse for them, for those who are torturing him. This makes us ask, what can people, what can people do to you? Those people are deprived of love in the first place. They are hungry for love. But you are full. What more do you need? Doesn't Jesus love even with his blood, even with the cross? Then you don't need anything from them. You don't need either honor or respect from them. Let them cut you up. So what? When we love God and satiate ourselves with the love of the cross, then we have the ability to love people. Therefore, we need to train ourselves. Every day we should sit in front of the cross for a minute and think about it. Then the cross will work in us and give us power to bear people and tribulations and to love enemies. Then this commandment to love our enemies, which started out with difficulty, becomes very easy once you know the cross, come close to it, and are satiated with it.